last day and it's a beautiful day. And um, naturally, I kind of speak quickly. So the good news is, those of you from the United States who are trying to get six months worth of vitamin D, as I did yesterday afternoon on the beach, we'll get that. I won't go over. Um, basically, what I'm trying to do today is talk about $100,000 capital raising mistakes that I have made and I've seen other fund managers and people raising capital make over and over and over again. And my goal here is not just to focus on bad things and having capital raise and things to avoid, but also to provide some proactive solutions to each of these mistakes. And hopefully, you know, each of you go away with at least one idea that you hadn't thought of before, hadn't thought of in a while, or kind of reminds you of something that you need to be doing related to raising capital. Presentations here, you know, talk to compliance before doing any things as well from you know, different locations. Um, next two slides are my experience. I won't spend much time on this. Um, and it's super interesting, but basically, to summarize what this slide and next says, is basically that I'm an analyst or a portfolio manager or an insurance expert. What I do is think about capital raising in family offices every day and try to look at what family offices want to invest their money in how you can raise capital more efficiently, how you can meet investors' needs and add value to them. And basically, you know, my background is in working as a third-party marketer and a capital raiser. Um, based in uh, Portland, Oregon, which I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in the room from that location here. Uh, we also have part of our team in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And you might know us based on a couple of these logos. Uh, the hedge fund group has, I think, it's 70,000 members now. Uh, the Family Office Networking Group has 35,000 members now, and we have about 1,500 members joining a week now to those two associations. Um, I also have a couple of books I've written, some free that you can get online, uh, such, a, such as uh, hedgefundsbook.com, and my other books are all available on Wiley and uh, through Amazon. All right, so just to summarize for what I'm going to talk about today, first off is uh, investor avatars. most funds I don't think really have a clear focus of who they're raising capital from. <laughs> Second mistake that uh, cost people at least $100,000 in missed capital raise is not doing a lot of specialized training for their teams. The third one is not constructing investor funnels so you consistently are meeting with relevant investors who are interested in what you're offering. Uh, the fourth one is spending too much money on graphic design while completely ignoring how your marketing materials are actually written and kind of optimized by an expert in that area as well. And at the end, I'm going to conclude with an idea I called speed of implementation. So this first mistake, I think, is uh, the most important. And I know a few of you have to catch airplanes, so I want to start with this one. Um, so if you forget everything else I say, I think this is like the most critical thing that um, you know, I spoke with a $17 billion hedge fund in Los Angeles last week and a billion dollar family office in Calgary that is running their own funds, and neither of them do this. You'd think that um, everybody would. It sounds obvious once I explain it, but I think it's something easily overlooked, and that is really focusing on developing a crystal clear investor avatar. And by investor avatar, I mean knowing exactly who you're targeting as an investor and not building out all of your market materials, all the benefits of investing in your fund, and making it sound good to any type of investor. Um, because what a pension fund wants to hear is completely different from what a high net worth individual wants to hear, which is different from what a family office wants to hear. And oftentimes, if you provide a general marketing presentation or pitch book to them, it's not going to really resonate with any of those groups. And so, um, I call this kind of a, a doctor approach to raising capital because if you think about it, when you go to the doctor, um, Everything is customized to you. Uh, when you walk into the doctor, you see him as such an expert because they've studied the human body and the problems with the human body so much with such a depth that when you meet with them, you listen to their advice almost automatically to whatever advice they give you. Um, but what's interesting is even though they have so much knowledge, when you meet with them, uh, they ask questions first. You might go in there because your knee is hurting, and they'll ask, you know, does it hurt when you go upstairs? Does it hurt when the weather is cold? 
does it hurt when you do this? Does it hurt when I poke here? And they'll ask a whole bunch of questions about your specific situation. And then they'll provide you advice and provide you some sort of potential solution or what the problem may be. And I think that this approach to meeting with investors uh, goes hand in hand with knowing exactly who you're working with for a few different reasons. The first is, if you already know, if you're already focused on one type of investor and you start the meeting out asking questions and you spend 60%, 80% of the meeting asking questions, First of all, most people trying to raise capital from somebody, they just pitch. If you're on a 45-minute phone call, you go through the full pitch book, maybe stop once or twice to ask if they have questions. And at the end, they might pick apart something uh, within the portfolio or ask about some certain period of time where there's a drawdown. Um, but if you approach it this way, you're basically learning about them first. And if you're focused only on one type of investor, such as uh, pension funds or family offices, you already know so much that the questions you ask are going to dig into issues which will show that you know their space, you know them, you've taken the time to really focus on their needs, and you're bringing something relevant to their attention by meeting with you. Um, this approach will lead to whatever you say after asking all these questions will be five times more powerful, and it will also lead to, after doing many of these meetings, you'll have that much deeper of a level of knowledge on this investor statement. So just focusing just on one type of investor, like family offices, just doing that can put you ahead of 50% of your competitors because they might be trying to raise capital from three or four investor sets. And if you care about just one, then all of your marketing materials, your pitch book, your one pager, the voicemails you leave, the emails you write, how you start out your meetings, even the, your brand, and who you hire to your team, all of that can change based on what investor you're focusing on to some degree. And by taking this kind of doctor's approach to asking questions at the same time, you can kind of um, go deeper with that. To really develop your investor avatar, um, there's some things to kind of think about. If, think about things from the investor's standpoint. Um, what are their headaches? You know, how busy are they? How many emails and voicemails do they get from other people trying to raise capital from them every day? Think about the past investment mistakes they may have made or that they're afraid of making and the career risk that goes along with those. Think about um, maybe their own career history that come up as an analyst most likely. Do they need to be, you need to use certain terms or words with this investor set and like you're focusing on them instead of another. Um, all of these things help you look at things through their point of view and think about what it's like to go through their day and then you can approach them at that same level and kind of integrate yourself into the problems they're facing, kind of speak their language. I think that just doesn't happen a lot of the times. Uh, people like myself who might be in charge of raising capital for a large fund will be in charge of calling 50 or 60 investors a day, just trying to get through the list and put a lot of action out there, hoping that some people will respond. And um, I think without doing these things, it's not very effective. And a good example outside of our industry is uh, Steve Jobs. Many times people complain, you know, oh, the iPad, you know, it doesn't even have a USB connection or doesn't have HDMI, um, but it's you know it's a hot selling item. And the reason that Steve Jobs uh, in the past have been able to develop products that resonate with people so much is that he included what people really wanted, and he left out a lot of things that maybe would be kind of nice, but really it's just noise and a little bit of a distraction. And instead, he focused on his target audience and that target person and that profile in the industry that he thinks would fit the exact functions of what he was developing. So to translate that into our industry, you know, if you're going to talk about your fund, you're going to a face-to-face -face meeting, and somebody has some initial interest in um, investing in your fund, you could speak for three or four hours on that. I'm sure all of us could speak for three or four hours on all of the analytics and the models and the work and the team and the history of the organization. You can speak for a very long time on your fund, because most of us are passionate about what we're doing, what we're involved in. But the reality is they only want to hear the 20 or 30 minutes that's most important to them. So you have to dial it down and really focus on the parts that are going to resonate with them the most because the rest is details and compliance checks and just qualifications for working together. It's not what's going to get their attention. And uh, through running the large associations that we have and our websites, we get approached by between 800 and 1,200 fund managers a year that want our help raising capital. And lots of the fund presentations start to look the same to me. Uh, all of them say that they're non-correlated with the broader markets, that in the down market, they do even better than the positive moving marketplace, and that they have a great team and a you know, proprietary investment process. They all say that. So I'm sure that uh, most investors, um, institutional investors especially, 
get 10 times the flow I do of managers and investment opportunities coming towards them. So if they start to look the same to me, then I'm sure that they're looking the same to them. So focusing on your avatar and really making the specific, everything you do specific to that avatar, I think is really powerful. And not doing this, you know, could easily cost your firm $100,000 or more, you know, per quarter, easily. Uh, many times, capital raising professionals will cost, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand a year to retain, and the opportunity cost of getting the wrong capital raiser or the wrong investor focus uh, would be well over $100,000. My uh, practical application of that last point is actually that I used to uh, raise capital for an emerging manager, a uh, hedge fund, as well as an $800 million fund as well as a $80 billion portfolio optimization shop that was releasing some new products. And at that point, we were calling investors of all types. And it wasn't until we narrowed it down to one investor group that we started raising $500,000 a week, $2 million a week, $3 or $4 million a week. And it was really that focus that really helped. So personally, I'm sure it's cost me at least that much money uh, in capital raise and capital earned. So the next mistake is having no specialized knowledge growth systems. This one is, uh, again, intuitive. I think once you hear it, it's sort of obvious. But it, most people in our industry don't uh, do this enough, I believe. It's obvious that uh, in the insurance industry, in the investment industry, in the hedge fund industry, that everything we do is knowledge-based. Um, you know, We're not stacking bricks and building foundations for buildings. Everything we do is based on our experience and our education. And it's really kind of ironic that in our industry, whether you get paid seven figures or six figures is oftentimes based on where you worked, your knowledge, you know, your intellect, where you went to school, etc. And we value that so highly before somebody comes in the door. But after they're in the door, we usually just want them to work on the fund, do their job, and usually less than $5,000 a year is spent on keeping their brain up to date and expanding their knowledge and deepening it within the very specialized areas they're in charge of. Many of you are here, so I guess I'm you know, speaking uh, to the choir, uh, preaching to the choir, but I do think that um, it's a big mistake for funds uh, and the investment industry in general not to invest more in their employees. There's uh, numerous scientific studies showing that in more quote unquote boring businesses like the container store in the United States that sells Tupperware, they spend $30,000 a year on training their employees and each employee outproduces their competitors by a multiple of three. And they're selling Tupperware, they're selling plastic containers. Um, our industry is based on knowledge and it's so central to what we're doing that I think you almost can't overinvest in specialized knowledge if your capital raisers have the best training in the industry. They're probably gonna learn one thing that's gonna help them raise more capital and pay for all that training for the year. So this, this is something that, again, is relatively obvious, but I think it's kind of ignored in our industry even though Pedigree is something valued above everything else before somebody comes in the door. This next uh, mistake here is my favorite one because it's a little bit less obvious. And it's actually less obvious to the point where most people uh, will disagree with what I say or say compliance department would never approve that or say we tried to do that and it failed or they'll say I'm very, very busy as it is. I could never put something like this together. Uh, there are many reasons not to do this, and I think that's why almost nobody does. Um, and that is construct an investor funnel. This actually looks a bit more like a pyramid than a funnel on this slide. But if you can imagine that um, on the bottom here is the broadest part of the funnel. And that is um, basically where you're trying to get the most potential investors interested in your expertise, in your brand name. Uh, then it moves up and gets more and more narrow until the most narrow part of the funnel and the whole point of building the funnel is to have them invested in your fund or to provide you with capital or to partner with you in some way. And what we're trying to do here is um, basically multiple things, which I'll cover on the next page. But just to go through this real quick, it starts with doing uh, media interviews, um, having articles published, having a column published, or um, you know, a guest article in some sort of publication in your industry, uh, then writing white papers, uh, reports, or surveys. Um, last week, one or two of you may have gotten it, but we sent out a white paper on how family offices and funds are thriving in Singapore. And we sent that out to 250,000 people. And it got a great response. That's a great example of, of doing this. Uh, the next level up is books published. Uh, when you publish books, many people, most people who hear you've written a book will look at the title. I uh, think you must be a relative expert on that title, never read the book, but your level of expertise 
rises a little bit, just the fact they've written a book on that topic. It was pretty hard to write a book. It does take a lot of work. And it's obvious that you're taking your knowledge in the specific industry you're working in in your very specific niche seriously. Even if you only sell 20 copies of that book a year, putting that on the desk in front of a potential client or in front of a potential investor is powerful and it positions you differently than all of your competition. Uh, because there's a statistic saying that 85% of all business people would like to write a book someday, but only 0.5% have written a book. And so you'll, the person on the other side of the desk might think to themselves, I've been wanting to write a book. You know, how'd you do that? Or I didn't know you were an expert in that niche. This is a strategy that works um, very well. Uh, the next level is doing speeches. Um, as, as I am right now, I'm actually recording the speech in the back. And I put that um, you know, on our website. It's on the familyoffices.group.com website. And that works really well in gaining credibility and leads in the industry as well. Um, I spoke in uh, Liechtenstein in November, and I spoke about family office investment preferences and what they like to invest in, what they don't like to invest in, what they like to see in the team and don't like to see. And by recording that and placing that online, I was basically giving away training content, not making recommendations, not talking about any fund manager or promoting, not talking about anything that would ruffle the feathers of at least the compliance departments that I deal with. Uh, as I'm a licensed um, Series 7, Series 63 in the United States. And that video has been watched several thousand times. So I've had numerous family offices and groups email us and say, um, you know, based on your expertise here, we'd like to meet next time you're in New York. We'd like, like to meet when you're here or there. So that's another example of this working. Um, besides just giving the speech and meeting, um, you know, valuable contacts in a room such as this, you can really use that in multiple ways. If you're password protected behind a website if you need to, uh, if your compliance is extra strict, or using it by just burning it to a DVD and sending it to a client, they might be able to watch a 15 minute or 20 minute speech. But you can protect it in different ways if it's more strict or less strict and your jurisdiction for compliance. Um, hopefully, all of these things will lead to more meetings. Um, and hopefully, based on more meetings, you'll have more capital invested. So obviously, just building an investor funnel itself is gonna bring in a lot of capital. But this is a strategy that almost nobody really takes the time to explicitly put in place in our industry in a way such as this, where it's thought out beforehand and it's constructed to bring in a lot of potential investors uh, to your fund. Um, one study showed that 78% of institutional investors won't invest in something that they don't understand. Um, and I think that all of these, uh, this pyramid of invest, this pyramid of uh, this funnel for collecting investors is, is basically about educating investors. So they might partially understand it, um, or they might, you know, have a base understanding, but not understand how your niche strategy applies. But if you've written white papers on that, a book on that, etc., it'll help them see your expertise in that area, but also hopefully get a better understanding. Especially if it's just a three or four page report you've written, it just is the ten thousand foot view of exactly how the five steps work within your niche. Uh, that can go a long way to helping an investor understand before they invest. I know working with a lot of family offices that they won't invest in anything unless they conceptually can understand the process and where the value is being added, not only in the investment, but also in your team. And by showing expertise in your niche area, you can do both at the same time. Um, many times you can use an investor funnel uh, resources within your pitch book um, obviously, it can make your bio uh, look more authoritative. It'll expand your knowledge and expertise. We talked about specialized knowledge. Um, doing these things will naturally build that. And um, many times I've found that having a folder of white papers and uh, resources such as videos can go a long ways in setting you apart from the average person that goes in trying to raise capital from someone. I actually have a video I recorded online that you can access for free. It's at uh, hedgefundtraining.com forward slash educational. And it's uh, just free and open access on the website there. Somebody who's done this who is in our industry uh, is Andrew Lowe. And I have no connection to him. I'm not promoting him or anything he does. I don't make any money by putting him here up on the slide. But he's a great example of somebody who's very well respected in the hedge fund space, professor at MIT, became one of the top authorities on risk management and modeling in the hedge fund space. And now, because of that, I believe he's associated with a few different ventures, including a line of funds, and I think he's you know, doing quite well for himself compared to other professors of risk management. And what he's done is he's built up uh, by writing books, 
writing white papers, uh, co-publishing in respective journals, and uh, speaking at conferences such as this. He's built up such a level of authority that people want to know what he's doing, what is he backing, they want to meet with him. And if he goes anywhere um, in the United States and he calls, you, know, you can bet somebody's going to not only call him back, but take a meeting with him. And I'm sure they're inundated with emails, voicemails coming towards them, the people that want to meet with them. So it's, it reverses the flow of activity. And that's the real point of doing all of this. Uh, this is something that I learned from Jeffrey Gittimer, just like a sales trainer. And basically, he had an average sales career. And he was trying to be a sales training type professional and also run a sporting goods company. And he was earning $50,000, $65,000 a year, halfway comfortable. Um, for being in that because of Charlotte. Uh, and basically, what he did was he started writing an article every week for his local newspaper. And it got syndicated to another local newspaper. And he would just give away one sales best practice every week. And that got syndicated to a couple more newspapers. He didn't charge newspapers anything. He was just happy to publish it in more places. He started getting a couple phone calls for clients who wanted to hire him. And he started earning more money. Um, and he just took that to the next level and kept on getting it syndicated to more and more newspapers. Today, he has syndicated his weekly sales column. I think it's called Sales Caffeine in 147 different newspapers. He's written 12 best selling books, and he charges more than Colin Powell for speeches. And uh, he's a multimillionaire in his business. You know, it's a private business, so he doesn't disclose it. There's a five to ten million dollar a year business, and he took himself from nothing to doing this just by giving away value in his industry, building his expertise. And I've read every book he's written, um, all 12 of them. Uh, because he's changed my whole life from this investor funnel construction method of growing your business and raising capital. I've copied his strategies and by giving away information on family offices, uh, by speaking, by writing books, and by doing all the things that he did, um, it's really helped me. You know, I've had over 100,000 people join our association. It's our website's the number one most popular website in the entire family office industry. Um, hedge fund book became a best selling book, and all of that was because of this strategy. So, I took a strategy from the sales field, and I'm using it in our own industry now. So, you know, if I could do this, I'm sure that one or two people on your team could put this together over a period of three to five years as well. And I think most of us in this room are here because we're in this for the long term. So, yeah, it's not an easy strategy, it's not one idea you can just kind of conceptually get and change how you raise capital. It takes a lot of hard work, but that's also why most people don't do it. And when I actually read about the strategy, it was within the second or third book I'd read by Jeffrey Gittimer, and he basically said, you know, out of all my books and everything I've written, here's the most important paragraph I've ever written. And I'll freely give away the idea of how I became so successful, because I know that almost none of you will follow it, because it takes way too much hard work. And he says, just write and give away your expertise, and not be afraid of someone stealing your expertise, your competitors knowing what you're doing and trying to track you. He said, if you're constantly learning and giving away your expertise, you'll grow so quickly yourself, and people will be so attracted to you and your knowledge that your success you know, will skyrocket. And at that point, I was passionate but not successful at all. Um, so I figured I had nothing to lose, and just put a lot of elbow grease into trying to copy this strategy, and it's worked very well uh, for our business, so for my business. So something I really encourage you to, to try out, but it's probably one of the least um, popular pieces of advice that I ever give while speaking and it's probably the least followed, but it might be the most powerful um, if it's actually done. Uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions, either while I'm going through this, and something you know, in this triangle doesn't make sense, or something I'm saying doesn't make sense, or you're wondering how to apply it, feel free to interrupt me or raise your hand, and we can take questions along the way if you have any. All right, so here is um, another $100,000 mistake and it is ignoring copywriting and spending a lot on graphic design. So most uh, you know, emerging managers, you know, 10 million to two or 300 million, will probably spend 10 to $20,000 getting the marketing materials in order and making them look professional, you know, institutional funds. Uh, I can spend well over $100,000, even for a year sometimes, on their PowerPoint pitch books, their one pagers, keeping everything updated, uh, making sure that everything graphically is in line with the brand they're trying to represent in the marketplace. And that's common, and everybody in the industry spends that money. But out of a thousand funds a year I speak to, and out of speaking to audiences that have been uh, probably close to 10,000 people overall, and running a 65,000 member hedge fund association, I've never heard of one fund 
that had a full-time copywriter on their staff, or one fund that hired a copywriter and even spent $10,000 on that copywriter. So out of the thousands of funds, I've never even heard of one. So this is something that I think is a mistake that everybody makes in this industry. And to be really clear here, copywriting has nothing to do, in this case, with the legal protection of something, or the legal rights to something, or you know, related to trademarks or patents or anything like that. Um, copywriting is a word used in the marketing field. Um, it's basically about writing in a persuasive way to get somebody to take action. So if you think about copywriting, just think about persuasive writing or writing best practices. And um, it doesn't sound that exciting on the surface, um, but if you think about it, you know, if you spend 10 or 20 or $100,000 on just the logo and just the flow of the PowerPoint and the frame around the PowerPoint, making sure it looks very institutional, why not spend 10 or $20,000 on making sure the words you say are actually the ones that are going to grab the attention of your investor, if you're a targeted investor or your investor avatar they have defined. Why not spend the time to make sure the very first sentence in your pitch book pulls in the reader and actually read your pitch book instead of flip through it, skip to your investment returns, and then close it and you know, wait for you to call it back. Like Why not make it so that it's persuasive and then take action and actually register on your website or watch the video or read your white paper um, there's all these best practices. Some people spend their whole 50-year career studying just persuasive writing and copywriting, and we're in an industry where lots of the sales process is done around pitch books, DDQs, due diligence questionnaires, one-pagers, uh, emails to first get somebody's attention, and all those things can be optimized so that, um, for example, imagine that if your capital raiser sends 500 emails a year, you know, just a 10% more response rate of somebody taking action and just replying saying, yes, call me at 2 p.m. today. Or yes, I'll be at you know, Game in Monaco in two months, let's have coffee. Just getting a 10% more response rate or even 5% more response rate can be 25 more potential meetings a year. It's a massive opportunity. So just a slight optimization in this area could put you miles ahead of your competition. And a great story for telling about like the value of copywriting and why it's so powerful is actually uh, the dollar bill a $1 bill versus a $100 bill. Um, if you look at them, you know, and if you actually hold them in your hand, you know, they're the same size, they have the same green and blue threads in the background, they're made out of the same quality paper, the same thickness of paper, there's no gold leaf inlaid in the $100 bill. They're both the exact same looking thing, except for they have a different message on the paper. So the number is different. Everything else is the same, it's not inherently worth any more. And the same thing is when you send a one pager and your client has 51 pagers on this table, you know, whether the client sees your one pager as worth one dollar and he shreds it like most of them, or he sees it as worth a hundred dollars because it's speaking directly to him, you look like an expert, your team has deep pedigree, they've heard you speak at a conference, they've read your book, or maybe your one pager is inserted inside of the book you've written on the topic they have an interest in. All of those things can make it so that it doesn't matter you know, everybody uses institutional quality heavy stock paper, everybody has a fancy business card, everyone has an institutional website. All of those things are standard, uh, and they look the same, just like a $1 bill and a $100 bill, but it's the message on the paper that makes it worth $100 million instead of $1 million. And lots of investors, they don't want to deal with a $1 million investment, it's a waste of their time to do the research and the due diligence on it. They want to look for the great ideas and the groups they really want to partner with long term grow with. So you don't want to be the one dollar bill, and if you focus on graphics, you know these guys up here are both pretty good looking guys. They uh, the same quality of picture. There's no better graphic design than on the hundred dollar bill. It's just the message. It's not about the graphic design. It's the message on the paper. So that's what you got to remember when it comes to copyright. You got to change your message, and you'll change how valuable it looks in the investor's point of view. Um, let's see here. So one reason this is so important to think about is that everybody in our business, I believe, starts a fund or a fund is started because of a model, because of risk management expertise, trading expertise, or portfolio management expertise. Out of all the funds I've met in my entire career, I've met one person who was an excellent salesman, and I think he ran a line of, uh, I think it was chicken restaurants, and he was a marketing and sales guy. And he started a hedge fund because he thought he was so good at marketing and sales that he was going to get into hedge funds. And he actually did raise a lot of capital, and he now runs a $1.3 billion hedge fund. So he's a real exception. Most people don't come from the uh, chicken restaurant industry into hedge funds. 
Uh, but that's one person out of literally thousands of funds I've spoken with. And it just makes sense. You, know, you start a fund because of the model, because of your risk management, portfolio management expertise. That makes sense. But the bad thing is that inherently, all of the executives in our industry have not studied marketing, have not read every book by Jeffrey Hidden, or have not even heard of the word copywriting. They don't know um, about a lot of sales and marketing best practices, which are relatively obvious to anybody who's studied this for more than two or three years. But our industry is built around other things. It's not started by marketing and sales professionals. So that's why a lot of this is overlooked, and why this mistake is so common. Um, the other great thing is that you know everybody else is ignoring this, so it only takes a few of these best practices being used, and your, your message can be twice as powerful as your closest competitors. This is something that's relatively quick to put into place. Within one or two months, you can put some of these best practices in place. Um, so it's a pretty quick uh, return on your money if you spend your time on this. Uh, those of you who might be familiar with Indiana here uh, on the slide, if you're not, um, what I'm gonna talk about now is storytelling, and it's a big component of copywriting. And if you forget everything else today, and want one quick takeaway of raising more capital, it would be telling stories instead of pitching. And um, Indiana Jones here, those of you watching this from Asia or somewhere, where maybe it's not the most popular movie in the world, um, is a famous movie character, and this movie follows a classic hero's journey uh, storyline, as does Star Wars, as did the recent movie, hit movie Avatar. Um, most movies and famous stories do. And basically it goes, basically, in the movie, there's a person who's relatively average, ordinary person. They get called upon to do something. They say, no, it's not for me. Uh, I'm not an expert in that. That's not you know, right for me. I'm, I'm nobody here. I'm just you know, I'm fine doing what I'm doing. Um, they then somehow get forced into the situation. Um, for example, those of you who have seen Star Wars, you know, Luke's uh, family's house gets burned to the ground. It's, it's, uh, who thinks are his parents get killed. He gets forced into the situation. Um, then after that, there's basically a challenge presented before them. They learn about the challenge. They learn about evil versus good, and specifically one type of evil. Then after that, the evil is personified by a single evil individual. That, see, that single evil person gets more and more evil, and then eventually there's a big struggle, and eventually they emerge as the victor, and they come out on top and everybody loves a hero. So that pattern of storytelling can be used with uh, how your fund was started, how your investment process started. It could be about working at an investment bank and you realize that things were just not being done right. And then after studying the industry for seven years, you started to develop a model on the side of your own that you thought was a bit more intelligent, like uh, Karen that we heard about yesterday morning in the innovation section here. And you start doing something that's unique and most people you know, don't value it at first. You're kind of just, you know, playing around with it. It's almost a toy, and then something happens, and it's just obvious that this is the thing that needs to be used in the industry. And by a speech in the industry or a friend in the industry, you get hired into a position, um, or you get backed by a family office investor who says, "Yeah, you're right. This is a model to work with. We want to back you. You know, it's fifty million dollars seed capital. Let's do this." And then, you know, part of the struggle might be battling the model. You know, the evil is the marketplace volatility, or the evil is the model which doesn't work perfectly yet. But after a long struggle, you eventually figure it out, and you'll constantly be refining your model like everybody does. But you've conquered it to some degree, and now you're emerged victorious, and you can tell that story. And it resonates with people, uh, because that's how most of our careers go. Um, for example, my own story is um, wanting to work in some sort of meritocratic position and after doing an internship with a hedge fund in college, um, I basically did interviews in commercial real estate, because I heard you can make a lot of money if you're really good at selling commercial real estate. Uh, but I also kept track of what was going on in the hedge fund industry. And after getting a couple of job offers in commercial real estate, instead of taking them, I instead started raising capital. And I tried to do it myself. And I got a contract with a fund to fund out of South Africa, one of the first ones that was growing there. And I got a contract with a New Jersey-based investment bank that had two hedge funds. And I tried to raise capital on my own. And I was really bad at it. I basically would look for mandates on Google and try to introduce them to these institutional investors that just put out this huge mandate. And basically, who knows, maybe they raised capital based off that, but I don't think so. Um, didn't really add a lot of value there, so it was horrible. And um, basically, by doing that, I learned what I didn't know. And 
basically learned that the evil in that case was figuring out how they had to raise capital, and it really started from nothing. So I started reading more books, but I also started figuring out maybe I need to uh, leave Portland, Oregon, not exactly the center of the technical universe, and go somewhere where I could learn this stuff. So I moved uh, across the country to Boston. Uh, didn't know a single person there, but I moved there and interviewed a bunch of capital raising firms. And all of them said, well, we want someone who has five, seven years experience. We don't want to hire someone who doesn't know what they're doing and tried to do something that didn't really work out. And I interviewed with them a couple times, had lunch with a couple, and I basically approached two of them and said, I'll work for you for free until you realize I'm going to help you raise a lot of capital. I'll just work really hard for you and don't pay me anything until you know I'm worth it. And at that point, um, it took about six weeks uh, working for free for one group. And uh, basically, they said, OK, well, you know, you make a lot of phone calls for me, so at least I'll keep you on board for a while longer. So they paid me two, three, two to three days a week to stay in the office. And then after about five months, he paid me five days a week to stay in the office. And then eventually gave me a raise, and I was a full-time capital raiser for him. And it was brutal. Basically, my first job was to call every institutional investment consultant in North America through the big green book of uh, institutional consultants and um, leave voicemails and talk to analysts and get due diligence phone calls set up. And I learned a lot by doing that, but it was really brutal. And again, at this new firm even, we didn't raise much capital. Uh, we're charging our clients uh, 10K a month retainers plus taking a percentage of capital raised on the back end through management performance fees. And you can imagine after you know, 12, 13 months of doing that, there's a slight pressure that builds up and the manager says something like, you know, dropped 130K and we don't have any capital in yet. Uh, so that, that pressure started to grow more and more uncomfortable and we just had to keep on switching strategies. And it was at that point that I started to use some more educational marketing strategies, trying to construct some sort of investor funnel by doing research on other white papers people had written and using their expertise and at least helping my clients by introducing them to information. It was at that point that I started reading sales and marketing books like crazy because I realized you can only fail so many times before maybe you, know, you should go back to Portland, Oregon with your tail between your legs and you know work at a coffee shop or something, um, or work in commercial real estate or something else. So basically, the pressure was on. I had to try a bunch of different things. And we started raising capital after about 13 months and started raising 500000 a week, 800000 a week, and then eventually a couple million dollars every single week. And that's a strategy of how I learned how to raise capital. I mean, that's, that's my story of how I learned how to raise capital is the hard way, is threw myself into it and basically, you know, tried to make it happen. It took a long time to do it. And that story sounds a lot more believable and, and I think that you guys can kind of resonate with kind of the struggle that took to get where I am because it just, you know, I'm not up here saying like, I'm the best selling book and I run this large association and you know, I'm the best capital raiser in the world and blah, blah, blah. It just sounds like, you know, What's this guy trying to sell me, right? So um, when you tell your story and you tell the honest truth, there's always a struggle. And if you just not change your story, not fabricate your story, but tell it in the way of not hiding the struggle, but just being transparent with it and just showing how you moved up your learning curve and got to where you are today, um, then I think people will resonate with that and they'll trust you and be like, oh yeah, that's the guy who did this and this. And then people remember stories and that's why almost every uh, fiction book and movie that's become a hit movie is based on the same hero's journey format because it works and that's what people want to see. They want to see the real struggle. They just don't, they don't want to watch a movie of um, you know, Indiana Jones just sitting in his museum looking at the artifacts he's already captured from the bad guys. You know, it's not very exciting. It's not very interesting. You don't catch anybody's attention. So by doing this, you catch people's attention and you do it in a way that doesn't make you look like a used car salesman or someone who's desperate for capital. Um, so it's really effective and um, something I think that more people uh, should be using in the industry. And again, it's something you can start using really quick. In your bio, um, it's best to tell a story with it's on your website, you know, on the About Us page. Tell a story of how your firm started. Lots of fun to do that much, but I just think that on due diligence phone calls or you meet someone for coffee or lunch, starting out kind of a story can kind of start off on the right foot. Um, you know, after you ask them a bunch of questions about them, then you can kind of uh, make the story fit the situation even better. For example, I could have told you a 90 minute version of my story of how I learned capital raising, um, but basically I'm telling a generic version that I think will be relatively quick and efficient for this situation if I was uh, speaking with the family office, then maybe I would include more details on how we actually started to raise more capital by paying attention to what family offices wanted and learning about their needs. So it's not that you make up a new story, it's that you can add more details where needed. Alright, one more
page here a couple of quick capital raising, just best practices you can use immediately to help you raise more capital. Uh, focus on the headline, it's the most important thing. For an email, the headline is a subject line, someone's scrolling through the Blackberry or you know, iPhone or Droid, uh, basically lots of times we see subject lines before anything else, and that decides whether we're gonna read that email or how much attention we should pay to that e email, or like last night I was scanning the emails, probably as most of you were looking for emergency important emails and trying to ignore the other 300. And the subject line is a lot what you know goes into which ones you should ignore and not ignore. Um, the headline, basically the job of your headline at the top of your website or one pager or the top of every page of your pitch book is to get the person to read the first sentence within the email. So the headline has to do that job, it has to grab their attention and get them to read the first sentence of your email or the first sentence of your one pager or the first part of your pitch book. That's what the headline is there to do. Not to say the name of your firm, not to say your name, not to say um, you know something sophisticated or something like that. It's really to grab their attention and make them read the email, whatever you think that would take. Um, if you're relatively famous, like Andrew Lowe, then maybe you should use your own name. But if you're not yet, with your very niche investor focus, then it's better to use other things usually. There's a study by Martin Sherpa in 2006 that showed that it'll increase the response, the open rate of emails by 30% if you use the first name of the person you're emailing in the subject line. It just helps them be a little bit more assured it's not complete spam. Um, and it'll increase the open rate by 20% if you use their full name. And that's like something you can even start today when you email people and you're trying to get a meeting set up. Another thing is the hook. If the headline's the most important, then the hook is the second most important thing in getting people to respond to your messages. And that's the first sentence of your email or the first sentence of your one page or pitch book. So the headline gets them to read the hook, the hook tries to convince them to read everything else. And if you get the headline and the hook right, you can just worry about optimizing those. You'll be light years ahead of everybody else in the industry because nobody, in my experience, ever studies this type of stuff when it comes to capital raising. Um, automated relationship development, something we don't have a lot of time to cover today, but there's tools out there that can do things, for example, an investor that maybe you qualified, you know for sure, you've been on the phone with them, you have a relationship already, you know for sure that they, you know, are a prospect for your fund and compliance-wise it's okay to send them additional messages. You can put them on something where every two to four weeks you might email them something. Maybe it's a white paper they can download or a message uh, about the story of your firm or something that's automatic and value-adding to them. Um, maybe an article you wrote or a link to a book that you wrote. Um, or an offer just to get on the phone. Maybe every qualified investor, you like to get on the phone with more often, and you just have an automatic message that might go out saying, hey, if you have time, next two or three days, I'd love to have just a 15 minute phone call. Here's my number, give me a call anytime, or you can set something else specific that works well on your calendar. And by doing some of those things, um, you can kind of automatically generate relationships uh, faster. Um, to give you an example of how this works, we've had um, 20,000 people download our family office report. It's at familyofficereport.com. We've had over 100,000 people download our free hedge fund ebook at hedgefundsbook.com. And all of those people get automatic messages once a month just saying, hey, if you didn't know, here's a free speech I gave in Liechtenstein last week. And you know, here's a link to the video where you can watch it for free. Just helpful relationship building things such as that can make a huge difference in someone uh, seeing your expertise in the space. All right, so before I get to speed of implementation, I just want to review the top four hundred thousand dollar capital raising mistakes. Um, first, is not having an investor avatar. Um, that one conceptually just need to figure out who you're targeting. But then the work is really customizing everything you do to what that investor base is going to care about. And the easy cop out on this one is that well, we raise capital from like three types of investors, or well, we like to you know uh, appeal to these two investors. But I think the reality of almost every fund situation is that usually one investor type or sixty percent. 80%, the lion's share of either the capital or the capital you like to deal with comes from one type of investor. So we really need to narrow it down and really make everything appeal to that one type. Next mistake is not having specialized knowledge growth systems in place, not having enough training for your team that really is specialized within their specific niche, having a library of books for them, sending them to conferences, buying training programs for them, and over-investing in that area to keep people fresh if they're on your team a long time, um, keep people learning all the time. Uh, no investor funnels constructed. This is the one where I showed kind of the pyramid up here. And again, it takes the most work to do. But I think it's one of the most powerful things you can put in place over time. And the last one was uh, spending $20,000 on graphic design. 
every year or every quarter in some cases, but zero dollars on copywriting or education marketing. I think those are all things that personally have costed me at least $100,000, and I'm sure it cost me most, most other funds and groups here in the room not that much money, at least per year. So the next idea I want to talk about is something that is one of my favorite uh, concepts for kind of getting business done and learning and evolving in either your capital raising process or your investment process um, or maybe a model you're developing. And that is speed of implementation. And uh, this is an idea I got going to a conference in Los Angeles uh, three or four years ago. And I heard from 10 different speakers at this one conference and they were all um, finance professionals and business owners that had 10 to $30 million a year in revenue plus businesses, all very successful people, uh, all in the field, fields of finance and being a CEO of a, of a mid-sized business or small business. And the only thing that all of them mentioned in common, so it took like 20 pages of notes, was speed of implementation. So I went in and tried to learn about speed of implementation and found like two articles on the internet on it, on a blog or two, and thought, you know, how can every one of these successful people mention this, but there's almost nothing on it. You know, what, what is this idea? So I started studying it, and basically the definition of speed implementation is to focus on instantly applying new ideas, lessons, methods, and tools to gain real-life feedback as fast as possible. So in other words, if you hear something about copywriting or constructing your investor funnel, you might think it's a good idea and put it on your list for the 2013 Navy list or put it on the list for a meeting sometime. But if you don't start using it, you won't get feedback, you won't learn how to adapt it to your investor target or your specific fund. Same with storytelling. Once you start using it, you might get some feedback, and people might say they like it or don't like it, or they might you might just feel the conversation going more smoothly after using a few of the strategies we talked about today. But if you don't use it, you won't know, and you won't know how to adapt it. So the faster you adapt things and put things into practice, the faster you learn and the faster you'll evolve. It's really a rate of evolution that we're talking about here when we talk about speed of implementation. Um, basically, the benefits of doing this is leapfrogging those waiting to conduct more research first, um, waiting for those that are stuck in kind of compliance, like frozen over mode, uh, waiting for those bogged down in bureaucracy and having just large teams that are hard to convince of things. Um, and basically, you know, if you can move up the learning curve three times faster than your competition just in copywriting or just in building expertise and building an investor funnel, um, yeah, that's gonna be a huge return because it's, it's compound returns over time and every year you're moving three times faster and learning these things, then you're gonna build out you know, a great process eventually. I spoke with a $2 billion hedge fund uh, last week in San Francisco and they have a team of 20 capital raisers and they're raising $100 million a month for their product I guarantee you there's someone there who has really studied capital raising and has their systems down. And um, you know, they're, they're only at $2 billion. Usually when I see a team that is that efficient raising that much capital, it's a $20 billion group or $50 billion group. So you know, I think they're gonna be very successful at raising capital. But it's a good example of them moving quickly and learning very quickly and have a very sophisticated capital raising process in place now. And that's pretty relatively rare for that size of fund. The next page here really shows um, um, you know, the process. Right up here shows kind of the process of why this works so well. So most of us um, you know, know step A, B, and C of a process, or just by hearing someone talk about uh, copywriting, might know steps A and B, you know, do storytelling, and work on your headlines and hooks. Uh, but steps C, D, and F, uh, C, D, E, and F, might be relatively confusing. Or you know, when you're looking to launch a fund, you might know how to do A, B, C, they don't really know D, E, and F. Um, there's many examples of this in business where the first couple steps are obvious and then you're not really sure where it's going to go after that. So you might wait to get more information, wait to see what a competitor does in that space first, wait to see how other funds launch in that little niche area first, um, and then see how that goes. But the problem with that is you'll never see E, F, and G until you're at step D. And um, you'll never see those next three steps until you've taken the first couple. Because again, that's how you learn, that's how you evolve, and you'll have more insight, foresight, you'll have more market feedback from there, and you'll know the next step. So you might say, okay, well, build an investor fund, that looks like a lot of work. But you know, if you just start on writing a couple articles, and then after you write five articles, put those together into something that looks like a white paper, call it a white paper, and start passing it out to clients if it's compliance approved. 
Um, you know, from that point, after you write eight white papers, like the eight chapters of a book, and you've written a book, after you've written a book, people are going to ask you to speak. So you don't have to know how to speak. You don't have to know how to even write a book. If you just start writing a couple articles of expertise in your niche, things will snowball, and the next step, P, E, and F will become apparent. And then, you know, step T is a huge quantum leap where people say, wow, you're so lucky. Like, wow, that's amazing, or that's a, you know, overnight success. Um, and you can't foresee when that's going to happen. You don't know what letter or step that's going to be at. But for me, um, it was really implementing the lessons from Jeffrey Gittimer and things I learned at marketing and sales conferences and really focusing on an investor niche and providing expertise in the marketplace. And really, the quantum leap for me was basically being transparent in what I do to raise capital, being transparent about what I know about family offices, and just giving away a ton to the industry. And some people will come up to me who raise capital and say, you can't give that away. You know, that's what we you know, use to get clients. Or you know, people are reading your website instead of paying consulting fees. And um, you know, it's really a matter of who's going to put the information out there in the industry first. Do you want to be in a consulting business charging 250 or $500 an hour? Or do you want to be in the fund management business and raise a lot of capital by being the expert on your niche? And that's the approach I've taken. So my quantum leap was realizing that and putting that in place. And now you know, having more and more opportunities are coming to me and having to turn those down rather than me having to cold call to get opportunities. Uh, for example, in Jeffrey Gibbard's case, he said he was struggling cold calling, literally going door to door and cold calling nonstop, just like I was in Boston when I started raising capital. And after he read, wrote this column and had it syndicated, his phone would ring full time and he needed somebody just to filter opportunities and answer the phone for speaking opportunities, for consulting engagements, for partnerships, etc. And um, we sent out the white paper last week on family offices in Singapore. You can get that for free at familyofficesgroup.com. And it took us uh, you know, a couple days to write that white paper. We gave it away for free. Uh, we sent it out to 250,000 people. I looked last night, and that page had been uh, viewed 19,500 times in the past you know, six business days or five business days. And we got over 1,000 phone calls and email responses from that. Um, so that generates a lot of opportunities, and it's by giving away expertise. And uh, that speed of implementation, that's like learning things. When I started, I, I didn't have that in mind. But um, you know, by writing articles, writing my first book, it, it made these other things more obvious. So in a way, you can kind of shortcut it. You know that if you build your investor funnels, that's, that T is going to come eventually, and they'll be quantumly forward in uh, the amount of opportunities coming towards you if you haven't already done this. Some of you I know spoke here in the last day or two, so you're already doing this. It might be relatively obvious. but. My point is if you move quickly, even if you can't see the end result, it might be a massive payoff at the end. Uh, two quick examples of this is um, in Boston, we're raising capital. I wrote a white paper. Um, actually, in that case, I even didn't even write the white paper. I just found a white paper that is useful on separate managed accounts and hedge funds, how to fit them into a portfolio, and gave that away to clients. They appreciated the help, and they saw me as kind of a link to that expertise of con or a conduit of knowledge. And because of that, I was able to get it wealth management firm relationships in place where basically our funds were approved at the wealth management firm level and the advisors of that wealth management firm or family office could you know, sell their clients into our funds. And if it wasn't for the educational resources, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And that's when we started raising capital and went from not being able to do much to raise more capital. So that's an example of I didn't know it would lead to me writing a book or speaking here in front of you. I had no idea. I was just desperate to raise capital in some way. And this is the way that worked out and it started with it. Other example is um, I wrote an ebook on hedge funds I told you about. It got downloaded over 100,000 times, and every day it's downloaded 50 or 100 times. And um, that led to Wiley backing me for a hardcover book. But even before that, that led to me getting feedback from people that I wanted hedge fund industry training. So I got together a team of board advisors and started the Certified Hedge Fund Professional Designation, uh, our own designation and certification program for the hedge fund industry. And because of that, um, they got the Wiley contract I spoke about. I've had over 1,300 people join that hedge fund training program, certification program in the last four years. And because of that, uh, multiple other opportunities have, have come up in terms of training in the family office industry and having a portal for them, um, as well as other finance related, you know, full day workshops that we hold on capital raising. And the last example I think is the most powerful is I gave the same, these two slides I gave at the end of the full day training workshop I gave in New York in 2011. I think it was in May. 
in New York, and somebody was helping me run the video camera in the back came up to me afterwards and said, um, you know, Richard, I heard you say that you couldn't learn anything on speed implementation, and then you had to do a lot of research, research yourself and think about it and try to apply it to your own business. And uh, you talked about maybe eventually writing a book on speed implementation. And he basically said, you know what, I don't know if you really believe in this concept, because if you really did, wouldn't you, you know, write the book tonight on that topic? If you already have that idea, wouldn't you implement that idea and just write the damn book on speed implementation? And I said, yeah, I guess you're kind of right. And he kind of called me, called me on that. And it was kind of a joke, and I walked out and I said goodbye. And I got on the red-eye flight from New York to Portland, Oregon. I got on the flight and uh, had a cup of coffee for free and started writing a little outline because he kind of like hit me between the eyes of this comment. And um, basically had another cup of free coffee and another cup of free coffee, and I basically wrote the whole book uh, flying from New York to Portland, Oregon, where our offices are. And it's only, uh, you can say it's only a 125-page book, and the first version of the book was only 90 pages. So it's a thin book. But, um, you know, really, that's an example of, you know, I'm not just telling you guys this is something that helps, it's something I try to really do to help myself raise more capital and grow my own expertise and knowledge. And it's something that I think is just really powerful. So it's not related directly to capital raising mistakes, so I just wanted to leave with that, um, just so you guys have something kind of actionable to work on, even if you're not working directly in capital raising yourself. All right, finish up here. Uh, there's a list of free websites and stuff here, but um, again, I'm recording this. You can always watch again later, get this list. You can also get the presentation from Ed. I think they're going to make them available on the websites. Or you can uh, email me at richard at richardwilsoncapital.com if you want the slides. Uh, so I'm not going to leave this up here for too long. And there again is my email address. My office is in Portland, Oregon, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Basically, our firm provide, tries to provide a lot of education in the industry, and we're just laser focused on connecting family offices with best of breed fund managers, is really our focus. So uh, that's pretty much all I had to cover here today. And uh, I think I'm out of time. So, do you guys have any questions? All right, well, thanks everyone for sticking around for the last speech, and uh, thank you, Ed, for having me here today.